Greetings, everybody. Uh, we're, uh, people are coming into uh, into the Zoom room, so we'll get started uh, in in uh, just a minute. Uh, but uh, warm welcome to everybody. We'll just wait for people to sign in. I know people are joining from all over the world. We're going to have a great discussion. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, and uh, the room is still filling up, so we'll give it uh, just a little bit more time. Thank you for your patience. Welcome everybody, we'll get started uh, shortly. We're just uh, still having people uh, join, join the call and then we'll get started. Hello to everybody, welcome to Book book club with uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, that, that's myself. And uh, I'm absolutely uh, delighted and thrilled uh, to be in conversation today with uh, Corey Robin, uh, especially about his uh, superb book, uh, a masterpiece, The Reactionary Mind, uh, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump. Uh, we have uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, Corey Robin is uh, a professor of political science, but I would also add a, a political theory, a philosophy, a history of intellectual ideas uh, at Brooklyn College and at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Corey, thank you so much uh, for uh, being in conversation today and uh, thank you for writing this wonderful book. Uh, as I understand it, the first edition was 2011, and then it was conservatism from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin. Uh, it definitely took a, a decided uh, turn further uh, of, of the wheel uh, as it became uh, conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump uh, in the second edition in 2018. I won't ask what the third edition is gonna be. <laughs> we, we don't know, but going from Sarah Palin to Donald Trump, already tells us something. Uh, could you introduce the book uh, a bit? Uh, of course, this is a, a, a vast history of conservative thought. And, and one of my questions uh, is in what ways uh, are Donald Trump uh, and Sarah Palin conservatives? And uh, maybe another question, in what ways do they have minds, uh, of reactionary minds? Uh, so uh, th this is an, another question for me. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me and uh, just really thrilled to be here at this forum and with all the people uh, participating. Um, I, I think you can get the thesis in some ways from the subtitle of the book. Um, it, it's a, meant as a deliberate provocation because I think traditionally most academics and journalists and people who pay attention to these things think of Edmund Burke as the towering summit of conservatism. Uh, a, a thoughtful conservative, and that what has come afterwards, particularly in recent years, um, has been this long decline. And what I try to do in the book is to say, there, while there have been changes, obviously, over time, there's a continuity there, and that the Edmund Burke we think we know, and by that I mean the traditional, reasonable, skeptical, cautious, careful man of prudence, was never anything like that, um, not in the, his life or in his thought. And I'm, I'm more interested in the thought. And the reason for that is, is it goes to the heart of what is conservatism about? What is it? And what conservatism is um, since the beginning uh, is a reaction, a counter-revolutionary reactionary movement against movements for the emancipation of the lower orders. Conservatism was born in the reaction against the French Revolution, 
virtually all historians and many conservatives themselves agree with that. Um, that was its animating principle and what it disliked in the French Revolution fundamentally at its core was precisely the idea of these subaltern classes that had previously been silent and obedient, um, that these people were suddenly acting in their own name, on their own behalf and speaking in their own voice and making a claim on behalf of themselves and on behalf of the political order that they should be uh, a part of it. And that, you know, that has been, it has been that idea that conservatism has opposed from the beginning. Now, what brings where we, where the Sarah Palin and Donald Trump part of this comes in is that conservatives, again, going back to, to Burke, have understood that in order to oppose that formation, the entry of these subaltern classes. You cannot simply reiterate traditional defenses of hierarchy and order. You have to come up with new defenses of hierarchy and order that in some way, shape or form speak to these very people who are now populating the stage, the political stage who had not been there before. That has to include them in some way, shape or form. And that has given conservatism from its very beginning a very uh, wild, populist, um, kind of democratic, I don't want to say democratic in any sense of you know, collective majority rule, but a kind of a, a touch of the common man and a touch of the common woman. Uh, and that has been the sort of magical elixir that conservatism from its very beginning um, has drunk from. A defense of hierarchy and rule by, by, by the elite but in a way that seems inclusive um, and appealing to the people on the bottom. Sure. This is to keep people out of the political system, but to do so in, in the American uh, context in an ostensibly democratic system, which is a tricky kind of business. Uh, so uh, that's what I would like to understand and tease out, but maybe you could take us through, Burke was writing in a not, of course, when he, was opposing the French Revolution in 1790. Uh, Britain had some of the uh, early beginnings of, uh, of uh, democratic governance, but still uh, not much uh, representation and so forth. And the elites dominated the politics. In the United States, it's been a, a weird ride, of course, uh, with, with race and class being core issues of Americana from the start and core paradoxes of the United States. So what has conservatism meant in, in American history different from how it evolved in, in British history? But I, I love the idea that, it, that it's all a, a continuity in a way, but in the specific context of, of the different countries. Yeah, so um, I want to. I would like to start a little bit with Burke and and another um, reactionary against the French Revolution, Joseph de Mass, because I think it'll highlight some of the what's different about the United States and what's continuous. So one of the ways that I think from its beginnings, conservatism has reconciled this issue that we're talking about of elitism, for lack of a better word, elitism and populism, aristocracy and democracy. How has it create, done it? One way, and this goes back to Burke, um, is by the conservative being a, an outsider. People forget this, but Burke was an Irishman in England. He was, um, Repute, you know, he was from sort of a Catholic family that was were recently converted uh, to Anglicanism. 
Uh, and he was not from, you know, the aristocracy. He was from the, you know, the, the middling classes. And Burke is very conscious of this. And it becomes very much part of his appeal. There's a wonderful tract he writes in the middle of the French battle over the French Revolution called Letter to a Noble Lord, um, where he repeats some of the things that you're going to hear from the modern American right. He goes after these guys who are defending the French Revolution from the House of Lords. So these are, you know, what we would call today limousine liberals. These are, you know, men of wealth and but, you know, they're politically correct. They're on the side of the French Revolution and they're sort of slumming in a way. And Burke is thrown into a rage by this. And he talks about himself, you know, as, you know, you people would never let me come through at every pass of the turnpike. I had to show, you know, my passport. I had to prove my credentials to you. And here I am, the only thing that stands between you and the mob. And you dare, you know, to challenge me. So this, this sort of outsider affectation, Alexander Hamilton is another one, right? Born in Nevis in the West Indies, you know, reputed, always had this rumor about him that he was um, of mixed race descent, you know. And they've, these outsiders have played this up. Sarah Palin, I'm from Alaska. I'm not part of the political, and of course, Donald Trump, the ultimate outsider, right? This has always been part of the way that the conservative has, recon you know, has reconciled uh, these two things. So the outsider is important. Another way that Demest in France, Joseph Demest, who was a real arch reactionary, when he defends the king, the restoration of the king after the revolution, he said, look, this guy, he's not, He's been through the school of hard knocks. Look at all he's suffered. He's like you, the king, the queen, as the victim, as the common man, someone who has not been cosseted and comforted with all the lap of luxury. No, somebody who's really had it tough. And again, we see that, I mean, I, I talk about this in the book that it's you know the conservatives who really invent the politics of victimhood um, and sometimes, you know, they have a real referent there, you know, when Louis the uh, 16th and then Marie Antoinette are executed, you know, or, in, you know, and leading up to that, they, you know, they are not at the summit of power, they're at the, at, at, at the, the bottom. But that idea of the victim has been um, extraordinarily important. Just jumping quickly to the United States, I mean, I think the big, the, the place where you see ground zero of how conservatism has created a populism of aristocracy is really in the old master class of the South. Um, they are the real pioneers um, in, in inventing racial ideology and very uh, conscious that what they are doing in inventing racial ideology, the ideology of racial hierarchy is giving every white man a sense that he is an aristocrat. In fact, James Henry Hammond, who is John C. Calhoun's chief lieutenant, he's a senator from South Carolina, one of the key theoreticians of the position of the Old South. He says, it's one sentence, he says, in the South, every white man is an aristocrat. Um, now for some of the Southerners, what that means is we've got to make sure that every white man owns a slave. And it's fascinating, there are movements to provide tax subsidies um, in order to allow white men to own a slave because the idea is if 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 slaveholding is not accessible to all white men um, they could very quickly become abolitionists so that's one path is to just make it easier for every white man to own a slave and that's a program that you see in the south the other which is john c calhoun's path is no start getting people to think that by virtue of that white skin that's where their superiority lies. And so race is the, I call it democratic feudalism. Uh, it is the classic means uh, by which um, a social system that is extraordinarily hierarchical, even among white people in the South, right? I mean, it's not as if there's a democracy of commoners among white men by any stretch. I mean, there are some real, you know, wealthy, powerful people. I mean, it's an extraordinarily oligarchical system, but, um, what you do is you, you, you race has been the, the, the sort of the, the one of the key ways in which um, this has this has happened to reconcile, but not the only one. I mean, I look a lot at gender ideology and also um, the sort of de the democracy of the entrepreneur 
um, you know, that idea uh, is another way. So, I mean, we could talk about all of these ways, but I, I think race is, is probably the kind of foundational argument with mode of conservative argumentation uh, in this country. So Corey is, I guess a, a, a big question for me, America has always been uh, deeply divided by uh, wealth and income. So we have massive inequalities, unlike uh, many other uh, pure countries in Europe or even in Canada and so forth. Uh, at the same time, we have massive racial uh, inequalities and, and obviously uh, race uh, has been uh, the flashpoint of uh, American politics from the very beginning. Uh, and more than the flashpoint, I think that's an, an understatement. Uh, it's, it's been the basic uh, axis of so much of uh, American culture and politics from the start. Is, is, is conservatism fundamentally about wealth and, and uh, race is instrumentalized? Or is conservatism about uh, wealth, race, gender, all kinds of privilege, and it's all fundamentally wrapped up together? It is to, to turn to, to jump to the, the current scene. Is Donald Trump, uh, is, is Donald Trump instrumentalizing race and migration to divert attention or build a coalition that protects the rich? Or is it actually all one thing uh, that, uh, because what's fascinating, of course, uh, in, in America and what has been argued from Du Bois and, and I think many others onward is that race is used to prevent a politics of class, to prevent a, the emergence of social democracy or uh, any kind of taxation uh, of the rich by, as you say, making every poor white an aristocrat relative to a poor African-American or a poor uh, migrant. So it, is it right to think about that question of, uh, is there a fundamental uh, theme of conservatism that's about what, Pre preserving wealth, or is it something more general? I don't know if I'm being clear. Yeah, but, no, no uh, I, 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 it's. I understand exactly what you're asking, and I and I'm glad you put it that way because you're. This is a debate that I think a lot of people, and it's not really about the right so much as ever. Everybody wants to know, you know, race versus class, and I think it's important when understanding the right conservatism to to get out of that matrix in the first place, and and, and for a couple of reasons. The first is, is that conservatism is a defense of hierarchy and privilege. And there are multiple forms of social hierarchy and privilege. Race is one, class is another, gender is another. Gender and the family are absolutely foundational to the conservative imagination. And in fact, what I say in the book is that what conservatives, when they talk about hierarchy and order, it's very much in these private regimes of power. I call it the family, the factory, and the field. Um, to try to kind of get at all of this. Um, and, you know, Burke, when he, you know, long before Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI are the targets of the French Revolution, but the revolution has begun, he says, you know, who's gonna be threatened here? It's gonna be every master with their servant, every officer with their soldier. And ultimately he's going to see prophetically long before anybody else does the revolution in Haiti. So it's these private regimes of power and they take multiple forms. However, and I think this is the second part of this that's really important for us to understand is that conservatism is always formed in reaction, to get, in reaction against movements of equality. So it's not simply a defense of these regimes, it's a defense of these regimes of power and hierarchy when they're under threat from a real political and social movement, you know, not from tweets on Twitter, but actual movements that are going to really start dispossessing people of their power, whether that power takes the form of wealth, whether it takes the form of white skin privilege, whether it takes the form of patriarchal authority in the family. It's when these movements happen that conservatives really get going. And then, and so it's that reactive 
instrumental part that, I, which is what you're sort of asking about is, you know, is, is race being instrumentalizing on behalf of class? What I would say is, is that conservative arguments are always instrumental. All of them are, right? And, and when conservatism is at its most powerful, ironically, is when these movements of the left are trying to dispossess these established uh, hierarchies and suddenly there is a counter movement from the right that rises up and says, we have the, we have the, 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 the system, we have the, the, the mechanism to stop these people on the other side. And the more comprehensive our side can be in its defense of hierarchy, that is defending more, more the more intersectional we can be. And I'm, I'm being deliberately provocative, but in many ways, the right is an intersectional kind of politics in a crude way, obviously. But, you know, they want to appeal to, the, to men. They want to appeal to white people. They want to appear, appeal to wealthy people. And, and to combine that into a comprehensive social, um, so, a counter social movement. So I would say my, my, the, 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 the summary of this long uh, oration here is that Conservatism is a defense of multiple orders of hierarchy, right? It's not one or the other, and it always has been, um, oftentimes private regimes of power, um, but that it is always instrumentalizing and coming up with new defenses of that hierarchy um, and something we haven't talked about, oftentimes borrowing from the very movements that they are opposing. And just to you know, give a quick example, you know, why all, um, you know, the right now talks about cancel culture and being threatened, you know, with silencing, using all the language that the kind of social justice movement of left has used over the last 20 years. There's nothing new or surprising about this. This is this is from the, the original playbook of the right, which has always been, as I say, extraordinarily instrumentalizing in its approach. That is <laughs> that is so insightful. And exactly, we I had a conversation uh, with Rick Perlstein about Reaganland, right. and uh, that that book is uh, a, about, uh, of course, uh, the women's rights movement, uh, the civil rights movement, the consumer rights movement, and the conservative backlash that it generated. But one of the amazingly uh, successful pieces of that backlash. Uh, that one can admire tactically, even if uh, I find it abhorrent politically, was Phyllis Schlafly, Schlafly using exactly the rhetoric of women's empowerment oh, sure. to say that that is the greatest threat to women's empowerment, uh, the, the women's rights movement. So yeah. in, in exactly the sense that you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she called her book, The Power of the Positive Woman. That was you know, hers was a manifesto for the, she was going to be the real savior. I mean, she says this, in fact, women's rights are threatened by feminism, right? The right to be protected by a husband, the right to be provided for by a husband, um, the right to be a homemaker. Uh, and this is, again, it's just, it's, it's, it's such tactical genius that uh, it often sometimes stops seeming like a tactic, but kind of very, you know, it, it, you act so much the part that you become the part. And, and this has been true from the very, very beginning that conservatives have depicted, you know, these people of extraordinary power, uh, met white men as, you know, as, as being under threat. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 that, and that it's precisely that being under threat that then authorizes them to have power in the first place. It is a victim-based argument for power, which is just extraordinary. I mean, you know, I'm a political theorist, you know, Plato doesn't say that the philosopher King's, the basis of the philosopher King's right to rule is that he's a victim. Aristotle doesn't say that the, you know, magnanimous man, you know, is, has been hurt. No, it's the opposite. Uh, and yet you have these arguments over and over and over again, um, going back to Burke and Joseph de Mest that, you know, we are, we, you know, we are the, the meek ones who have been beaten down and it is time for us to uh, re, you know, reclaim what we once had. And that is exactly the Trump uh, approach, yeah. pure victimhood. Yeah. And Every, you know, everybody cheating me. Right, right, exactly. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. 
and it 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 just helps me to also if I you know when I uh, think about the American history of my lifetime, uh, I was born in 1954. I grew up in a you know in an FDR household uh, where Franklin Roosevelt was of course, uh, the greatest president. And I still think he is the greatest president as, as an adult uh, after all these decades. Uh, I do look back at him and what he brought uh, in the Great Depression as the greatest thing. And then watching what I think it's right to say was basically one swing of the pendulum during my lifetime from the New Deal era, which I would date from 1933 to essentially the arrival of Richard Nixon, but especially uh, with Ronald Reagan really making the revolution and us to this moment still not getting out of it. Right. And trying to understand that conservative era. Uh, and the puzzle has been always for me what we're talking about, which is many forces came to, uh, came, came, uh, 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 to, to play during uh, these critical years of the 60s, 70s, and the, and the rise of the conservative movement, but it was the civil rights era, the women's rights era, uh, and so forth. Uh, but it was also the incredible uh, class war by the rich on the poor that started at the same time. So right. somehow class, race, uh, gender, all became implicated in the same way. And the genius of the Reagan uh, movement, which has now been, in my view, 40 years uh, in power, more or less, and is still holding on even in these days as uh, we watch whether Biden can make any kind of breakthrough or not, uh, is that somehow an incredibly grotesquely unequal income of district unequal distribution of income. And some of the richest people in the United States are able to harness a mass movement. Yeah. And so again, you know, are they instrumentalizing these other fears successfully and brilliantly, or is it deeper than that? And uh, why do poor whites or working class whites sign up for this exactly yeah. uh, and, and why are we why does in our time why is joe manchin uh senator of probably the poorest state in the country taking everything uh every, every dimension of, of poverty to bear of west virginia why is his mission in life as a democrat and a senator of the poorest state to hold back progressive economic change. Yeah. This, and, and how does he get away with that? And why is his state uh, one of the largest majorities for Trump voters? So that, that's a lot, but let me turn it back to you. <laughs> no, no, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I think the first thing I would say, because I think a lot of us on the left, you know, have this question about race and class and gender and, you know, there's a part of the left, um, I, I think it's fairly small at this point that, you know, wants to try to find a class politics without dealing with race. And, you know, actually, you know, you see a lot of these debates on uh, popularism and David Shore and so forth that are going on. And what I would say is it's sort of unavoidable. Um, and go back to the New Deal. The New Deal was a massive project of political redistrib redistribution of wealth and class power, right? It was also a math, I mean, and people don't talk about this, this that much, but you know, African Americans in the North between 1932 and 1936 dramatically swing from going from the party of Lincoln, they voted for Hoover in 1932, overwhelmingly to the party of the Democrats, and they never turned back for the most part. And the question is why? And that is because African Americans uh, saw a real opportunity for themselves in labor unions, in the kinds of redistributive programs that however limited they were and oftentimes exclusive of African-Americans, nevertheless 
uh, you know, they saw a possibility there. There was also a tremendous amount of civil rights agitation within the New Deal coalition going back into the 30s in the North. Eric Schickler, who's a political scientist at Berkeley, has a wonderful book on this called Racial Realignment, showing that, you know, the civil rights movement and the New Deal coalition doesn't, you know, just begin in the 50s or the 60s. It goes back to the 30s. And women, um, you know, Washington is, you know, D.C. is a place and the New Deal is a place where many feminists flock to. Uh, and, you know, you can see it in the Hollywood films, you know, the rise of the new woman who's independent and not so tied to her husband or marriage, but with a career. Social movements have a way of spilling out like that. There's just, there's no way that you could have the kind of universalist, uh, universalism of the New Deal rhetoric and not have it set off explosions in the sphere of the family, in the sphere of race and all the rest of it. It's, it's inescapable. It just cannot be done. That's what that happens in the French Revolution. It sets off all of these things. And Burke, of course, saw that happening. So there's no way of putting that genie back in the bottle. And, and it's always going to be there. And that is going to both be the great capaciousness of a revolutionary or revolution or reformist movement of the left, but also it's great vulnerability because you can't reform gender relations in the family without upsetting a lot of husbands, some of whom might be part of your New Deal coalition. You know, it's, it, they're unavoidable, these things. But That's without, what I, by the way, uh, Corey, just to say, uh, so brilliant in your, in, in the book and so eye-opening is this, the, the private spheres of power as being relevant here because you know, as an economist, I think about classes or, right. you know, the median income and those right. below and those above and how it should just divide. And what you're reminding us is that issues of class or gender or any opening of the economy or any basic equalizing measure in the economy affects at the household level or at the community level or in the block or in the factory or as you say family factory field on the farm uh, social relations right. and so if someone has what I wouldn't even recognize as a, a power relation vis-a-vis -vis someone else because I put both of them on one side of the class divide Right. This could be deeply threatening at the micro level and perceived yeah. in a way that's completely different from some grand equalization of income. It's it's a brilliant, crucial insight. I mean, it's it's really the you know the micro politics of power, and you know we credit feminism with inventing you know the personal as the political. In some ways, it was the right that first understood that because they oh they they have this old regime mentality that all social order is essentially a form of real personal dominion and rule of one person over another. And in the grand abstractions, not just of economists, but of the left, that oftentimes is lost sight of. And um, it is both the great promise of the left to break those very tangible personal bonds. That is what liberation and emancipation is all about. And if you ask any woman in the women's movement, any worker in the workers' movement, any African-American in the freedom struggle, uh, they will tell you, you know, at the heart, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton says this very clearly in the 1850s. Why are these guys so obsessed about women's suffrage? What are they <laughs> so afraid of? And, it, it, you know, a light bulb goes off and she says, it's, it's at the home. That's what they're terrified of. And in, during the battle over Reconstruction, you see the same thing among uh, civil rights activists in the, in the 1870s. They say, you know, they'll, they'll, these white people will be OK if there's like a, a representative off in Washington. You know, they just want to make sure I'm you know, tipping my hat when I'm walking down the street. So they're very personal. And that is a great opportunity for the right. Now, but, but uh, the, the, the flip side of that, what I wanted to say, because you were talking about Nixon and Reagan, and, and, and Trump as the sort of fulfillment of this kind of really ugly right-wing populist, you know, politics. What I'm always struck by, and this, uh, you know, something that I think many on the left really disagree with me about, but I'm, I hold to it very strongly, is that from, if you look historically, what I see with Trump and the GOP today is actually that populism has become 
weaker and weaker and is not providing the same kind of political elixir that it once provided. And you can see this just in the presidential returns. Compare the landslide that Richard Nixon had in 1972 to Reagan's. I mean, Nixon, it was like 63%. Reagan is about 58% in 1984. George W. Bush gets, you know, 40, I mean, sorry, 51, 52%. And Trump, of course, never, it, it, both times is a minority uh, president and second time loses. Um, the fact that we see the right relying so much, I mean, rely, I think what's more important to understand the right today, right now, is less, frankly, the kind of nasty racial appeals, as vicious and as awful as they are. But from an analytic perspective, what I think matters far more to the right today are things like the Electoral College, the Senate, um, and the, fil uh, the filibuster, the filibuster and, and the Supreme Court. These are all profoundly anti-democratic. They're, they're deliberately counter-majoritarian institutions. That's their whole purpose. So far from populism being the kind of secret of today's right, um, I think what has been, the right to me looks more and more kind of like what conservative Tories looked like in Britain circa 1820, before mm -hmm. the Great Reform Act of 1832. That is, you know, what was the secret? You know, the Tories ruled Britain from, I don't know, the 1790s, to, you know, it was, it was hardly anybody who wasn't a Tory who controlled parliament. And, and what the secret of the Tories was, was what we call rotten boroughs, right? These gerrymandered districts uh, where voting was very difficult. Um, and it was a kind of losing battle that they had because the modern world um, you know, has unleashed democracy as the kind of lingua franca. And when, when you see conservatives today increasingly using these um, institutional counter-majoritarian mechanisms, I don't think that's a sign of their strength. I think that's a sign of their weakness. Um, that doesn't mean they can't hold on to power for a long time. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but what I'm struck by is that where once these kind of the rabid racial language, the coded language, but nevertheless rabid of a Richard Nixon and of a Ronald Reagan, um, was able to kind of propel these vast majorities. Those have gotten progressively smaller. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a great it's it's a great point, and it it is really the frightening thing. Of, of course, Trump never, I don't think, uh, in a, in a day in his administration had a had a net positive approval rating, <laughs> uh, like you're saying, uh, never won a majority vote, and so forth. It's frightening, of course, to watch all the, the, the machinations of trying to uh, keep minority power uh, or power of, uh, of, of a uh, definitely a minority of the population. So it's perhaps more unnerving yeah. uh, that if one felt that our institutions will hold, don't worry about it, it's a lot of noise and heat we'd feel better about it, but they seem pretty nasty. Uh, yeah. This this group, uh, shockingly nasty. And, and so it's uh, all the more worrisome. Yeah, I agree. Um, the reason I dwell on this, though, is really for the left, because I think, you know, I, I'm slightly younger than you, but I really came of age uh, during the Reagan era. Um, I mean, I grew up during the 70s and the 80s. And for me, you know, I think the left and liberals and Democrats have always had this kind of um, angsty feeling about themselves that somehow we don't represent the majority of the country and that what the majority is, is racist and sexist and vicious and nasty, you know, Hobbes is, you know, nasty, brutish and tall. Um, and, uh, but, and, and, and the fact is, is that there was a reality that corresponded to that because the right was winning majorities. I think what's really important for the left to be clear on is however vicious and nasty these people are and racist they are, it is not a majority winning program. And I say this to, because the left's attitudes towards racial equality and economic equality are often moralistic, but haunted by the sense that it's politically unrealistic, right? We're morally right, but politically we can't do it. And what I'm trying to say here is, is that that division no longer holds because the politically smart thing, the majority, there is a majority that rejects this kind of politics. And, you know, 
For years, you know, the, the left would hide behind the Supreme Court and the counter majoritarian dilemma. And, you know, it was the court that was going to advance civil rights. Those days are gone. And still, but still the left tiptoes around these issues. I agree. To an extent. I agree. And I think it does, that, it does have that feeling. How could we really make this case? There's so much, uh, you know, so much pushback and so on. But what has struck me on the economic side, because, you know, I'm basically focused uh, on the social democratic issues, so raise some taxes from the rich and help poor people to uh, get the, the education that, that uh, everybody should have, be able to eat properly, decent shelter and so forth. And I'm shocked in our uh, in, in our uh, wealthy uh, society that we alone of the high income countries, we don't have the basics, right. but absolutely consistent with what you're saying, public opinion runs consistently 60, 40, 70, 30 in favor of these issues. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, indeed uh, on the issue that we're facing in the United States right now, uh, rather painfully and poignantly taxing corporations and the rich. It's something like yeah. two to one in favor of raising the taxes. But then when it comes into the Congress, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's by a vote one way or another. And it's just right. awful to watch this, but it's not public opinion. Right. Uh, and, and, and Corey, I face the same thing in uh, all the work I do on climate change legislation where I'm asked constantly, uh, especially in Europe, how can you convince the American people about these issues? And I say, it's not the American people. They want right. They, right. they want climate safety. They want yeah. clean energy. And they've been saying it roughly 70, 30 for decades. But the political system is, is really broken. Yeah. So can, can I ask you uh, just about that? Because how, how do you fit the institutional analysis, uh, I, you know, I, I think we have a very corrupt, uh, inherently corrupt political system, though it's legalized corruption in its way. It's a, it's a pay for uh, play politics uh, relentlessly in $14 billion spent on, on the last election cycle. How does that part of the political game and the ideological uh, and uh, populistic part fit together in, in your thinking. How do you uh, how, how do you join the ideas part, the battle for uh, public uh, opinion, and the uh, the, the uh, mechanics uh, together in the U.S. context? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, and I. When I started writing about the right, it was in the early years, uh, the first part of the George W. Bush administration, so almost 20 years ago. And, you know, the issues I was focused on then um, was, you know, war and, you know, the, the way warfare was being used by conservatives um, and the, the attractions of violence. And then I started focusing more on, uh, you know, these kind of populist issues that we've also been talking about. In recent years, I've really been struck by the extent to which those those things don't again don't explain the persistence and the potency of the right anymore it is really these institutional mechanisms it's these things that are sewn into the constitution um, now what program policy does that lead us to i'm you know i'm not a political strategist i don't have the answer to that but i think to the extent that people on the left can increasingly focus on the fact that there is a majority, there is a popular majority for these positions, right? And that appeals of race, however nasty they become and are increasingly becoming, are also decreasingly popular. And that what really is- And, and after all, with a, sorry to interrupt, but with a, with a demographic change in the United right. States that is, so much diverse, wonderful diversity, in, in my yeah. opinion, yeah. Uh, for all of that also pushing not only the change of values, which is certainly happening, but also just the change of who we are in the United States, yeah. making it happen in a very wonderful way. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see this, you know, particularly among younger voters and, and, and all the rest. Um, that it's really, you know, it is really, um, and I think in particular, it's the Senate 
and um, well, the Senate, the Electoral College and the Supreme Court. I mean, to me, this is the triptych of right wing power today. Um, and in some ways, the fact that the Democratic's more, Democratic Party's more ambitious program is being stalled by one or two senators, however enraging and um, uh, you know, frightening that can be, particularly when you consider the stakes of climate change and things like that, in a way that's kind of progress um, from where we have been before. Um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, everything was thought to be, you know, possible through a reconciliation package, you know, there's none of this, we got to get it to 60 votes with at least the big ambitious thing, I think shows signs to me of movement. Um, I think the biggest problem today is, is that we're sort of in this interregnum period. I really feel this quite strongly where the right's traditional appeals are weaker and the left has not figured out the final, you know, the, the, the final mechanism to kind of produce the sort of realignment that I think um, is possible uh, right now. You know, by realignment, I mean those great realigning elections of 32, 1980, 1860. I, I don't know where that leaves us, but that's the way I see it today. We, which, by the way, you know, I, I've been waiting for that for a while because yeah. I, also, I also grew up uh, reading Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and right. the idea of, of the political cycle that every 20 or 25 right. years, so somehow starting in 19, it, well, I started counting in 1968. So I thought maybe Bill Clinton was it. No, uh, then I thought, okay, 2000, uh, Gore lost. Well, certainly Obama was the swing and then it didn't happen again. Right. Uh, so, uh, that that uh, frustration is there, but I, I did uh, learn. I, I I think that one of the problems is that these institutional devices are uh, of of white uh, rule. Uh, this entrenchment are a deep part of our system. Uh, they're not uh, you know they're not the last gasp necessarily right. because we've been there before. Yeah. And in one of uh, the book clubs, uh, I had Richard Rothstein uh, on mm, to talk yeah. about The Color of oh, Law, wow. which is an absolutely remarkable book about uh, de jure segregation uh, in residential housing in the United States. And I noted uh, one of the, or referenced one of the horrible Supreme Court decisions under the Roberts Court uh, on housing, and I thought it was so outrageous. And I said, how could this happen in the Supreme Court? And Rothstein rightly said, but Jeff, that's always been the court right. other than the Warren Court. Right. And it really took me uh, aback. But yeah. then thinking about it, the Supreme Court has been a profoundly conservative institution yeah. in American history, almost always, with the exception of the time that I grew up. So right. I thought that was normal. But uh, you know whether it was uh, 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 whether it was uh, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson or uh, whether it was Dred Scott or uh, Citizens United or right. other horrible decisions, the Supreme Court has been on the conservative mind side throughout history. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, the whole uh, awful uh, uh, post Reconstruction. Uh, uh, Jim Crow era shows what can be accomplished by manipulation in the United States. And that's partly what makes the current situation so frightening. Yeah. They don't have the votes, but boy, do they have the determination uh, yeah. not to relinquish power democratically. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, another side of this is that when they do have power democratically, um, and I'm thinking of the first two years of the Trump administration when they controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. Um, what was fascinating to me was how little of their program they were actually able to get through. I mean, this is, was extraordinary, you know, this, the, the trifecta of power that they had. And with the exception of the tax cuts, um, yep. the, bud the budgets that they put through, I mean, they, it was very clear. Um, there was a great article in The Atlantic on this in like 2018. You know, these, these, these were Obama budgets, basically, um, with the exception of the tax cuts. Um, and so it is true that they're determined to hold on to power. That is absolutely correct. 
What the purpose of that power is and what they want to do with it, I think is an open question. And again, this is something where I think people on the left really disagree with me because you see the kind of awful cruelty of things like at the border, um, in immigration policies and so forth. But it struck me that it was, it was kind of amazing that they weren't able to get a nativist, they weren't able to get any immigration bill through Congress at all when they had total control. Um, so it does, it does sometimes seem that the only accomplishment of, well, I mean, it's, it's been a, a heavy one, but uh, the one consistent accomplishment is tax cuts, yeah. tax cuts for the rich, uh, yeah. because uh, Reagan delivered that, George W. Bush delivered that, and Cheney famously said when he was told it couldn't be afforded, he said, we won the election, that's what it was for, right. uh, and, and uh, Trump did accomplish that. Uh, and uh, of, of course, uh, it's these have been grotesquely unfair and, and unaffordable and have ramped up the public debt uh, to historic highs because we don't pay for the government that we absolutely need. But the point you're making is also completely right. The right has never been able to cut the size of government because the public wants it. Yeah. So in the end, they don't go through with that, even with d- dismantling the bogeyman of Obamacare. Right. They couldn't find a, a way to, to do anything. Right. And I think that's something important for the left to also keep in mind is that when you create institutions, I mean, that's that's the secret of, you know, in political theory, those are the founding moments is when you create institutions. And why do you do that? because it locks in things and changes long after the revolutionary reformist fervor is gone. And it makes it very hard to dismantle them. Um, Social security, you know, the the, the dream for, you know, of the right for since its creation was to get rid of it. Were they able to chip away? Absolutely, there's no question about it. Um, But, you know, they can't get rid of it. And so to me, that's why you know, with whatever power the Democrats have, you know, the you know, locking in institutional changes that can't that are, that, that are hard to undo, and like even the Obamacare thing is fascinating. I mean, the, it's one thing you know for George W. Bush to try to take on privatizing Social Security sixty years after it's been in in existence, right? <laughs> Obamacare had hardly been in existence at all, right? And its benefits were only just beginning to trickle down when when the the Republicans took over and they weren't able to do it. They weren't able to get rid of it. Um, They've done piecemeal this, that and the other. But, you know, that's 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 what they've had to settle for. So I think there's an opening there. I think the institutional gridlock is very hard to overcome. Uh, But I think we're in a different kind of a ballgame. And I hope that the left realizes that. And part of the point of this book is to say that the things that seem most grotesque and awful about Trump are A, long-standing, and B, what's most significant about Trump and the GOP today is not the viciousness of those things, but their steadily weakening appeal to a mass majority electorate. It's a wonderfully uh, uh, <laughs> reassuring to hear this and, and actually very, very cogent and uh, I'm reminded also that when I uh, spoke to Rick Perlstein and uh, read Reagan Land, uh, another uh, great book uh, to understand uh, modern American politics, the viciousness has been there for a long time. We forget it. Uh, yeah. and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the viciousness is not new. Uh, the language is not new. Indeed, uh, Ronald Reagan's slogan in 1980, it was make America great again. Right. Unbelievable, by the way, that no one has no, or very few people have noted that <laughs> that, that crude grab of yeah. a slogan, and he got away with it as right. if it was his own, which right. isn't a, you know really a great mark for our journalists, I have to say. In uh, in, in uh, I mean, there's this a, up. there's a lot of presentism. In, in journalism and in the electorate and frankly in um, academics too. And, you know, um, a couple of years ago, I did a piece for Harper's about how uh, whoever the right is, the current right person, 
it always feels like this is the worst we've ever been. And I and 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 I trace this in Philip Roth, actually, of all people. You know, when Nixon was go happening, he said, This is, you know, this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to us. Then Reagan came along and Nixon wasn't so bad. It's right, you know, and, and and there's always this revisionism of the past. And I think uh, by the really- way, I'm exactly that because <laughs> and, and, I, and I didn't even realize until now, I've been exactly on that line. He's the worst ever. I used to think so-and-so was the worst, but he's the worst. So I'm completely in this, in this presentist mode. <laughs> well, it's a, you know, we all to some degree are, but I, I do think that's part of having the historical perspective on this stuff is, you know, a lot of this stuff is not new and that helps us see what is new and what is uh, changing uh, for, you know, for better or for worse. One of my favorite paragraphs of your wonderful book, which I uh, I want to conclude on because it, it just conveys in how rich your writing is uh, and how wonderful it is to be traversing history. Uh, you say that you use the word conservative, reactionary, and counter-revolutionary interchangeably, uh, but there are I, he's, you write, I see philosophers, statesmen, slaveholders, scribblers, Catholics, fascists, evangelicals, businessmen, racists, and hacks at the same table. Hobbes is next to, next to Hayek, Burke across from Donald Trump, Nietzsche uh, in between A. Rand and Antonin Scalia with Adams, Calhoun, Oakeshott, Ronald Reagan, Tocqueville, Theodore Roosevelt, Margaret Thatcher, Ernest Junger, Carl Schmidt, Winston Churchill, Phyllis Schlafly, Richard Nixon, Irving Kristol, Francis Fukuyama, and George W. Bush interspersed throughout. Well, that is Corey Robin. Uh, that is why your book is uh, so much fun, Corey. And I mean, not not just fun. It's a, it's an amazing read uh, and an amazing way that you help us to understand history and our present and our presentism uh, by taking the the long perspective. And I wanna thank you uh, for a great book. And I wanna thank you for, I'll say cheering me up tremendously because you you remind us that um, we're facing with the the conservative wave and with uh, Donald Trump, we are not facing a majority of the American people. We're not in a heartless, country. Uh, We are not facing uh, absurdity of uh, the majority of our fellow citizens. Uh, We're facing a political movement that has used these tools, uh, this instrumentalization or these fears uh, and uh, appeals to hierarchy and power for a long time. uh, And it's waning. I think that should be our takeaway message Uh, from our conversation today. Corey Robin, thank you so much for being together uh, for this uh, conversation. We've been discussing the reactionary mind, conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump. Please, everyone, read this remarkable book. Our next conversation will be with Keisha Blaine, a professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, We'll be discussing her uh, also uh, superb book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. That's on November 17, 12 noon Eastern time, 1600 UTC. Uh, Please uh, join us uh, on uh, that uh, exciting occasion, November 17 with Keisha Blaine. Corey, thank you so much. And to everybody listening, uh, thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.